go back and fix anything in your life, would you? Yeah. You honestly would. Nothing gets me like real found footage. Almost 20 years ago, a group of teenagers made a videotape showing the abduction of one of their very scared friends, complete with heavy verbal abuse, humiliation, and violent threats throughout the video. A couple days later, all five teenagers would be arrested for kidnapping and several other charges. They named this tape The Real Blair Witch, a title that has nothing to do with the Blair Witch Project except the style of filming. All five teenagers would claim that the video was fiction and that the girl that was being abducted in it was acting. The girl, on the other hand, had a very different version of events. Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, I do videos on creepy and disturbing things. Today we are talking about this weird found footage tape that is fairly real, even though thankfully nobody was physically harmed. It was called The Real Blair Witch, and it was from 2003. We're gonna get right into that. However, this video does have a sponsor, gratefully, so we'll roll to that, and I will. 15th, 2003, a one-hour documentary about the Real Blair Witch Project found footage tape aired on Channel 4 in the UK. Mysteriously, it only aired once and was never in public circulation. Also, it was aired in the UK in spite of the fact that the film was actually made in Flint, Michigan. The documentary explores the version of events from the point of view of the teenagers that were involved. Everyone has a different story in the documentary, leaving the footage mysterious and everyone questioning to this day what really happened. Like I said, this whole documentary with the actual footage from this found footage tape in it only aired once and has never been in public circulation. But of course, thanks to Reddit, we have access to the whole thing. So it started out all with Reddit user Old Demon posting about how they remember seeing this documentary back in the day, but couldn't exactly recall what it was, and also just wanted some help from the Reddit community in finding the full thing. They all knew it existed because, I mean, it, there was an actual trailer for the documentary as well as an IMBD page for it, so it wasn't like we were misremembering. Reddit came through as usual. User name Transbian8787 posted the original 2003 documentary fully on YouTube for us. We're gonna be talking about that documentary today and just everything going on with this very, very strange, scary tape. Okay, so I'm not gonna be saying their full names just because it's gonna get confusing enough as it is. Just know that we have five perpetrators here and then one victim. The five perpetrators were Derek, Jimmy or Jim, John, Travis, and Christina. The victim in this was named Danielle Taylor. Now, we also need to establish real quickly that Flint, Michigan, by all accounts, according to many people who have lived there, it doesn't have a lot going for it. And I don't mean that in a mean way, just in a purely all the teenagers there are extremely bored way. Danielle Taylor lives in Flint, Michigan. She works at the Taco Bell. And on one night, she goes and visits these people that she doesn't really know that well, but they're like sort of friends. Like she's kind of starting to get into their group. The group that she went to go hang out with, like I said, was four guys and one girl. The girl was Christina. The four guys were Jimmy, Derek, John, and Travis. That night, the latter five teenagers essentially planned on kidnapping Danielle, torturing, humiliating and eventually killing her and getting the whole thing on tape. They want to tape the whole thing so that they can become famous and then they can hopefully move out of Flint, Michigan because again, by all accounts, they all wanted to leave Flint as soon as possible. Spoiler alert for the end of the tape, I kind of said this already, but Danielle does not die. She is okay. She leaves that night completely unharmed, at least physically. The film itself is these five teenagers really torturing her, at least verbally, threatening her and pretending like they're gonna do all this stuff, even though really that's like the supposed plan. They all know they're not actually gonna do this. Just so you all know that as we watch footage of the documentary as well as the tape itself throughout this video, know that some of it is triggering and also just very, very creepy and scary looking. Like it really looks like they're setting up a film, but just know that the plan was never actually to harm her the whole time. So we know Danielle is actually safe. 
The problem is that we don't know if Danielle knows that she's safe or not. That's a separate issue. That's what this whole video is about. So we'll get to that in a minute. So the tape starts out, they're at the house. They ask Danielle what she would say if she knew that this was her last day on earth. Danielle kind of jokingly replies, uh, fuck you. One of the other guys comes up behind her with what looks like a blindfold or a gag, something like that. And they ask her to say, ready, set, go for the camera. Danielle refuses and she dodges away, sensing that guy behind her. And that's when it starts. They all gain up on her and bind her hands and feet. There is more footage of her being tied up in the house. She is then put in the backseat of a car. She's blindfolded and she's tied up. They're taunting her verbally and one of them even taunts her with a knife. Notably, the knife appears, if you look carefully, to have tape covering the blade. Another thing to note is that one of the perpetrators, Derek, stayed home. He participated at the house, so he does get in trouble for that, but he did stay at the house when they left with Danielle, so he wasn't part of the actual kidnapping. Danielle, still in the car, starts to cry. They ask her to say her last words to her friends and family, and she does. They ask her if her life is good, and she says yes. Then she corrects herself. She says, well, it was. All right, you have, uh, I don't know, let's count down. You have 15 seconds to say whatever you want to say. As they approach the woods, Travis Payer tells Danielle to say goodbye to her family. Mom, everybody, I love you. <laughs> I'm sorry for everything. And to you guys, I really don't have much to say to you guys, because I can't say nothing. Why can't you say anything? Is your life good? Yeah, well, it was. Did you think that before you came over? Yeah. The group then arrives in the woods and is then seen on tape carrying Danielle through the snow and to a graveyard where there's an empty grave. It's about four feet deep. They place her in it and tell her that they're going to slit her throat, but not enough to kill her, and then bury her alive and leave her there. Finally, they take the blindfold off and put it around her neck instead. Travis, who's like the ringleader of this whole thing, takes the knife and goes above her while she's sitting in this grave and he pretends to slit her throat. He doesn't. He does the motion clearly over the cloth. He doesn't even injure her. But in spite of that, Daniel pretends to slump over as if she is injured or even dead. Danielle continues to stay slumped over in this hole as the rest of them laugh and talk about credits for the movie, all taking their bows and how they were involved. That is how the videotape essentially ends. We'll get to more details about the actual found footage tape as we go on and explain what's going on. All five teenagers, of course, are soon seen on the documentary being arrested, and the documentary features real court footage. Danielle takes the stand in a pre-hearing, and she claims that the whole thing, while it might have been a joke to them, was not a joke to her. She claims that she had no idea that this was all some prank and that they were acting. She claims that all five of her kidnappers took her into the woods against her will, threatened to kill her, and it wasn't until they didn't that she realized that it was all fake. From the five teens' perspective, when they were arrested, they all claimed that this was a fictional movie. They claimed that Danielle was in on it, that they told her beforehand, that she consented, and that she was acting the whole time. And indeed, all five kidnappers were never planning on actually hurting Danielle. That's evident by how not super violent they were, how they never hurt her or assault her physically, and how the knife had tape on it. To them, it was all a joke. It was a prank. They were acting. They wanted to scare the new girl in the group and get some good footage of it to have this fun, feeling so powerful of another person. Maybe it was a hazing thing. They also just wanted to cure their boredom for a night. And like we said, they were hoping this footage would make them famous and they could get out of Flint. However, a lot of people, including myself, believe that they just said that Danielle was in on it and she knew the whole time after the fact to cover their own asses. 
I don't think they realized that what they did was super shitty and also just super, super serious until it all came to a head and they actually got arrested and there was consequences for their actions. Just because the five defendants knew that it was a prank the whole time and thought that it was all a joke, doesn't make it not kidnapping if the victim was actually scared and was actually moved somewhere else against their will. Even if you told her at the house that it was all a joke and that they were acting and that they were about to kidnap you, if she said no and said that she didn't want to play this game, it is still kidnapping whether you think it's a joke or not. It's already a little messy, but pay attention because this is where it gets more messy. That is the tape itself. The documentary basically explores whether Danielle was in on it or not. Jimmy, one of the kids that was interviewed in the documentary, says that they told Danielle about this four or five days before it happened. They told her, we're going to be doing this, we're going to be filming it, so you don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but get ready. And up until this point, Probably most of you are just mad at the perpetrators and are like, they suck, they're horrible people. However, there is some evidence in the tape that perhaps Danielle was in on it. First of all, at the beginning of the tape, she's kind of smiling at the beginning of the whole ordeal. She's not actually struggling that much at first, as if they had told her, and she does know that they're not actually going to do anything. I think maybe this shows that she did kind of know it was a joke at first, but I think they just took it too far and didn't stop when she was clearly in distress. However, then at one point in the recording, she tells the group that the rope is loosened, suggesting that she was trying to help them make it look more believable. Like, why would she tell them that she could escape if she was being held against her will? I don't know if you care about the rope, and it came off my arm. You could argue that she was just scared and wanting to make sure that they knew she was complying and trying not to escape. Like she was so scared that she wanted to be upfront with them so that hopefully they wouldn't harm her. Then possibly the most damning, there's this shot of her scratching her nose and then putting her hand back behind her back. This suggests that she wasn't actually tied up at all or at least not very tightly. She was always free to go whenever she wanted and that she knew that she was free to go. Again though, to play devil's advocate. Maybe she wasn't tied up very tightly, but they were all very intimidating still, and she was still too scared to run, but she knew that it was okay to scratch her nose. I left this part out before. At the end of the tape, after they talk about all their credits and take their bows, Danielle is helped out of the hole, and they all ask her how she's doing. She says this. Let's get her out of this. I survived. And I'm freezing and my arms what? hurt. If you move anymore, I swear to God, I'm using a blade <laughs> to do this. All right? <sighs> This really does make it seem like she was in on it and she seemed just fine. Like she knew it all along and that she's cold and tired, but overall fine. However, you could also argue that this was pure relief. If she thought this whole time the thing was real and that she was going to die and then finally they took her out of the hole and told her that it was all a joke, this could just be her reaction. Maybe she's just in shock and she's so relieved that she's not actually in danger that she just plays along not knowing what else to do and just knowing that that's the quickest way to get her out of the situation. But you have to ask, then why did she slim her head over for several minutes as the group took their credits and everything? Like after Travis, you know, quote unquote, slit her throat, why did she slump over and play dead? That seems like she was doing that for the camera to make it more believable. This just seems really strange. Again, you could argue the opposite, that she was playing dead, that she was in so much shock. She didn't know why she didn't feel any pain, but she thought that they really were going to kill her. So maybe she was playing dead, hoping they would leave. This one is really hard because it does seem pretty damning that Danielle was seemingly acting during this part. But on the other hand, you really in the end can't judge how you would react to the situation 
if it was real to her. Like if this was actually happening to you, it's kind of hard to say like, oh, she's clearly acting. Like if you were in that situation, actually thought you were gonna die, you can't just say that you know exactly what you would do. And then the defense would also argue that it was weird that Danielle took a full two days before she went to the police. Danielle actually went back over to the house to hang out with them. She wanted to watch the tape with them. And so they watched the tape, but little did they know while Danielle was there, she took the tape and replaced it with a fake one. This was two days later. And then after she had the tape, she went to the police. The defense argued that this made it clear that she was fine with the whole thing, but then decided that she wanted to get back at him, decided later that she was mad or whatever. Mind you, this was 20 years ago when that kind of thinking and victim blaming was very common. I don't think that this particular argument, waiting to go to police has any merit merits in my opinion. Victims, as we know now, can take sometimes years to really grasp what happened to them, acknowledge the fact that anything happened to them at all. It could take them a long time to just realize and come to terms with the fact that what happened to them wasn't their fault. I don't think there's some like magical timeline that victims going to the police means that they're being truthful or not. Just want to put that out there that the two days going to police thing has means nothing to me. Maybe for all they know, maybe they she was so scared of the group that that's why she waited because she couldn't decide if she really wanted to go to police or not because of what they could do to her. Or maybe she felt really guilty because it did end up being a prank. Maybe she was really, really embarrassed. So she felt really embarrassed and stupid because they told her at the very end of the night that she was never in danger. And it took her a while to fully process that and then be able to realize that no, something, this wasn't right. Then after that, she finally got up the courage to tell the police. However, like I said, this goes back and forth a lot. It's very messy. You could argue that why would she go back over to the house to watch the tape with them so she could steal it? Why would she go back to the friend group alone if she was so scared of them? Again, can't say how I would react in that situation. She claimed that she did it because she felt like she had to. She felt like she had to get the tape so she could show police. And if she went to the police without the tape, then the friends would hear about it and they would destroy the tape and therefore destroying all the evidence. So she felt like she had to go get it. And then you also have to ask, why would she give the tape to the police when there is some evidence on there that she was, you know, pretending like at the end when they supposedly kill her, she slumps over. That does look very acted out. So then the documentary also explains how this group has done this exact same thing before several times. They did it to another friend, Sarah, about a week before this incident. She knew they were kidding all along and she told them to knock it off and they stopped. Sarah claims that they also warned her a few days before that they were gonna do it in advance, but Jimmy again claims that they didn't tell Sarah. They also pulled the same thing on none other than Christina herself. Christina who would then go on to be a part of the plot when they did it to Danielle. So this does definitely seem like some weird friend group hazing thing. And with Danielle, it was the first time they filmed it. And then there's Travis. Apparently all the girls in the group had a crush on Travis. And remember, these are all like 18 to 20 year olds. They're very young. This is important because multiple people in the group claim that the girls would fight over Travis, get mad at each other, cause drama all over Travis. Some people in the group claim that Danielle did this whole thing, decided to go to the police with it as a way to get back at Travis because she had had shown interest in him, had a big crush on him, and he was not reciprocating. And so she got mad and turn them all in because of that. I have to include that because it is part of the documentary and it's an important piece of this puzzle. However, I will just say that's, I think that's really silly. I don't think that somebody would go to court and then to trial and risk going to trial and doing all this legal proceedings and having to testify that much 
because she got rejected. It's totally possible, I guess, but that seems a little far-fetched in my opinion. And then Christina. Christina turns her back on all of them and she makes a plea deal. She wanted a lighter sentence, so she tells prosecutors that Danielle was not informed of the prank in spite of what they had all been claiming before this point. This messes everything up for the defense and all of her friends. She also agrees to testify against the guys, and in return, she only got five years of just probation, no jail time. The boys claim that, again, maybe Christina took this plea deal, again, because Travis wasn't interested in her, and that made her mad. You see the theme of the teenage boys saying that all the girls do all of these quote-unquote crazy things because of a crush, like... Just some inherent sexism added in there to boot. Again, this was 20 years ago, but yeah. Derek is given six months probation because he was in the house for the start. And like I said before, he didn't take Danielle to a second location. So he wasn't part of the actual kidnapping part. So he got a pretty light sentence. Jimmy, John, and Travis, actually before it went to trial, they all ended up pleading guilty to a lesser charge. So the whole thing doesn't end up going to trial. I don't know exactly what they got, but I don't think they saw too much jail time, if at all. So then another weird thing that will you'll probably see if you ever look up this story is that three of the six of these teenagers passed away since this happens. Travis, the ringleader of this whole thing, and he was the one that all the girls had a crush on. I cannot prove 1000% that this is him, but there is an obituary with his full name matching the name in the articles about this story. It also says he was from Flint, Michigan. The ages line up and it says he passed away in 2006. Reddit has speculated and there is rumors that Travis passed away from the S word. And this being only a few years after this whole ordeal, people believe that maybe part of the reason he did was because of this. Like I said, it's all speculation. I have no interest in speculating about cause of death when there's no proof. So I have no idea, but it's just a rumor that you'll see around. Then we have Jonathan H. Cockreel. Again, if this is the same person, the obituary says he's from Flint. The ages again match up. And some of the commenters on the obituary say that he was a filmmaker and he passed away in 2014. I have no idea how. Derek also passed away. Derek Faxlinger also has an obituary. Again, if these are the same people, can't prove 1000%. A man from Flint, Michigan. He was born in 1983. Again, it all adds up. He passed away in 2007, just a year after Travis. His obituary says that he passed away in the hospital and that his close friends included Travis, Jimmy, John, and a quote unquote Chris. So again, a lot of coincidences, pretty sure this is the same person. Another article that I found says that he had a seizure that caused him to hit his head. So his death was an accident. And then as far as I know, Christina, James, AKA Jimmy and Danielle are all still alive and doing well to this day. Given all the messiness of this story, what I personally think happened is that I, I mean, I'm always err on the side of believing victims. I think there's a very small percent of people that actually lie about being victims. However, I think there was enough evidence in this case to know that Danielle had to know somewhat. She had to be in on it a little bit. The fact that she clearly wasn't restrained so much that she couldn't reach up and scratch her face, the way that she was talking with them and interacting with them and not struggling, again, can't judge how I would react in that situation, but just, you know, based on pure optics, the whole like going to the graveyard, pretending to be dead and staying slumped over. And then once they told her it was a prank, just, you know, being interviewed after the fact, like all of that, I personally think that she was in on it, at least some, but I think that they took it too far. I don't think she realized how far it was going to go, or she kind of knew that they weren't actually going to do anything. I mean, that was clear by the fact that they were never physically harming her. It was all like violent threats and scary words that they were using and everything. So I think at some point, I think she did kind of know, but I think 
she was really scared at some point. I think she didn't realize they were actually going to take her to a second location. And then maybe they were just making so many of these threats that she did start to kind of wonder what was going on. If she wasn't fully consenting to this whole thing, I don't see how it's not an issue. It definitely did not feel like she had consented to the full thing and therefore the five perpetrators are in the wrong either way. They still caused significant emotional damage to her as well as just made her actually scared. But of course, I wanna know what you guys think. Leave a, me a comment down below and let me know your thoughts on this subject. And that's gonna be it for today. Please like the video just to help the channel out and I will see you all next week. Thank you so much to all my patrons. Shout out to top tiers, Colin Holmes, Deck of Cards, Michelle Valdovinos, Tom L, JJ, Quasi Eli, Little Kittle Cat, Mitchell Schaefer Meyer, Mike, Alice Paul, Dark Sided Otter, Brittany Phillips, Willow Winchester, Bambi, Momo Neon, Philip J, Covey, Marita144, Sage K, Literally Lacey, Elderly Hipster, Christina Amos, Veronica C, Reese Rolls, B, Leon James, The Puppy Hag, Rebecca Jackson, Headless Fancy, Toby, Carter, and Kawakan Anime and Gaming Convention.